Welcome, everyone, uh, to this LSE Department of Geography and Environment inaugural lecture by Professor Ricardo Crescenzi. My name is Andres Rodriguez Pose. I am a professor of economic geography in this department, and I'm your host for today. If uh, you like using Twitter, we have a Twitter hashtag, which is uh, hashtag LSE Multinational, and please be free to uh, tweet as much as you want. Um, I think there are very few events that will give me as much pleasure as being here today. Uh, just introducing Ricardo Crescenzi uh, as professor uh, at the LSE. Few things because I think he's thoroughly deserving of this accolade. I can say that he is one of the most prolific researchers of his generation. He has published and is pub publishing an enormous amount of uh, articles that are having a huge impact. Impact, academic impact, because he has been already cited more than 2,000 times in Google Scholar, more than 800 times in Scopus, and also, not just academic impact, also big political impact, because he has been advisor to quite a lot of international organizations, regional governments, but also including the European Commission, the European Parliament, the Inter-American Investment Bank, or the European Investment Bank. And not only is he a great researcher, he fulfills one of the other factors and categories that we expect of every good academic. He's a great teacher, having already received the teaching prize as one of the best teachers in the LSE. This is all has been recognized. He's got plenty of prizes. And I think every stage of his career has deserved a prize. He won the best prize of the Royal Geographical Society to the best master dissertation, and I'll come back to that later on. He won the Italian Regional Science Prize for the best uh, doctoral dis dissertation. He has been awarded the Young, Italian, Young Talented Italian Award, which is quite a big accolade. And just on, on Saturday in Vancouver, he was awarded the Jeff Hewings Prize to the youngest researcher, to, well, to the best regional scientist under the age of 40. But I don't think I'm here because of that. And I don't think I'm happy because of that. Because any of those factors will already deserve him getting his chair. I like to be here because he's a great friend He's a great person and someone whose trajectory can serve as an example for many of you sitting here. I remember him in 2004, just 13 years ago. He was sitting where most of you are sitting, doing the masters in local economic development. And to make sure that sometimes we get things wrong, despite the fact that his dissertation got the prize of the Royal Geographical Society, the best dissertation in geography in the country, he did not get a distinction in his dissertation. <laughs> so for many of you that complain about that, there's still hope. You can turn things around not in 13 years as he has done, in two or three years, and then come and say, look, I told you I was better than what you thought at the time. Second, he has already made big changes in that period. He has worked his way up step by step, like a good Boy Scout. On the first hand, he, has, he went to, uh, he worked as an assistant here. He went back to Italy to finish his uh, PhD, spent some time at UCLA. After finishing his PhD at the University of Rome III, he ended up in, at the European University Institute, I cannot think of a better place, to do his postdoc, and only after that, five years after he was here, he finally made it as a lecturer at, uh, at a university. So in that respect, he has gone every little step. We put them through a lot of hurdles. We gave him a lot of work, big responsibilities like taking over uh, what was a trap, like the Masters in Local Economic Development, which he actually uh, led uh, with uh, gusto and with always a smile on his face. And he for just for that, I think, is the most deserving person of being a chair here at the LSE. But my last words are going to be to Ricardo, just a quick message. It's saying that uh, just because you become a chair doesn't mean that you can rest on your laurels. 
I'm going to quote here either Voltaire or Spider-Man. And with great powers come great responsibility. And you now have greater powers, but you have first a big responsibility, first towards you. You have conducted very important research. From now on, you have to do better. Second, towards your students. They will look up, up to you and they will say, we want someone to be like him, we want someone to mentor in that way in order that we can get more of what we, come, what we expected to come and get at the LSE. And then, probably the most important is towards society. Because your research no longer concerns your career. It does concern what you can give to the rest of us, what you can give to the rest of society. And you're doing social sciences. While you're doing so so social sciences, most of your research should be geared towards improving the livelihood, improving the quality of life, the well-being of citizens all over the world, and the best way to do that is to link what you're doing to policy advice. And I think the research that you're going to present, which is your research agenda for the next few years, the multinational world, how cities and regions win or lose in the global innovation context, is going to be a good example of this new responsibility and the new path that you're going to take over the next few years. Many congratulations and welcome uh, as a professor to the LSE. Thank you very much. So thanks, Andres. Uh, let me start uh, uh, by thanking uh, uh, the people um, who made uh, uh, this possible uh, in uh, <coughs> chronological order. Uh, let's start from my parents uh, who are here, my <laughs> mom and dad. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my wife, uh, uh, Amalia, uh, uh, who helped enormously uh, to make me uh, uh, be here uh, tonight with you. Um, and <coughs> this lecture uh, is dedicated to our daughter, Lydia. Uh, so, uh, thanks Andres, uh, thanks Andres uh, for chairing uh, uh, this event. Uh, Andres uh, is the chair uh, of today's meeting. He was my tutor uh, during the master. Uh, he was uh, uh, my uh, co-supervisor, joint supervisor during my PhD. Uh, he was a mentor uh, at my time as an assistant professor here. Um, so, I mean, he knows a lot about me and I owe uh, a lot uh, to him uh, as, as, as a mentor uh, for uh, my uh, uh, research achievements. So, thanks, Andres. And I would also like to thank other professors who are here uh, and uh, were with me, uh, uh, some of them also during my master's, uh, Michael Storper. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, jointly uh, published a number uh, of, of papers as well uh, with Andres uh, and Simona Iammarino, uh, who is sitting here as well, uh, thanks to these fantastic colleague, uh, colleagues. Uh, and I also like to thank some of my professors from the University of Rome uh, who could not uh, come and be here, uh, Guido Fabiani and Fabrizio De Filippis. And also, of course, I'm grateful uh, to a fantastic department uh, uh, for uh, uh, making me a chair, allowing me to grow professionally and learn a lot uh, of what I know today. today. Uh, so thanks uh, to the many colleagues. Uh, a special thank uh, to a, a special colleague, uh, Silvia Chant, who, who made it uh, today. Um, I would like to thank the department for organizing and hosting this event. Uh, thanks to Catherine uh, uh, Mitchell, who uh, provided all uh, the organizational and administrative support. She was great, in, great dealing with me, late with my slides, uh, and all these small uh, uh, but very important things. So, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you uh, uh, in particular to uh, many of my students that I see uh, here uh, today. Thanks to my uh, past students, uh, and thanks to my current students. Thanks uh, for being here uh, tonight. Tonight it looks a, a bit like my wedding. Uh, so many friends and uh, <laughs> families here. Uh, but now that you are all seated, uh, you are all here, uh, I can start, uh, relax, and actually uh, enjoy uh, the lecture. Uh, let me see, is there a pointer? Is there? No, there's no pointer. How? Okay, I'll do. Yeah. Just, 
okay, the old, the old way, it's always the best. Um, so <laughs> let, let me start by saying uh, thank you. Uh, tonight I'm really just a frontman uh, of a very large uh, team of scholars and researchers who work with me uh, on, my, uh, on the research that I will present today and on my ESC grant. So uh, I'm really uh, a frontman, a speaker, although all the errors, of course, are my responsibility. A lot of the merit for uh, what I will present goes uh, to my uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, uh, pictured here. Look at these people. Uh, uh, there will be uh, many more uh, inaugural lectures uh, in the years to come. So let's start from the beginning. Okay, let me start from the very beginning. In 2003, uh, during my master's, when I was here uh, as a master's student, uh, calling my girlfriend cost approximately 600 uh, pounds. Okay. Uh, in 2008, when I joined, uh, again, the LSC as an assistant professor, the same, calling the same person, not the same person, uh, <laughs> cost me nothing, okay? So uh, this trend uh, induced this uh, dramatic change, this dramatic reduction in the cost of communication across distance, induced many scholars, many commentators, to conclude that the world is flat. However, if we carefully uh, look at the world, we discover that it is actually not flat. And it took me an entire PhD to come to this realization, to understand that the world is not flat. Um, looking at night lights, looking at uh, planet Earth at night, we can see how concentrated uh, economic activity is around the world. We can see entire areas that are bright in this uh, picture, but we can also see entire continents that are completely black, that are completely in the dark. If we look at uh, 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 night lights, we can closely link them with a number of other indicators, uh, indicators of economic activity. This is the map of patenting activity, of innovative activities. Okay, we use patents. These are sort of academic papers where you describe a new invention. Okay, these are ways to record new invention. We can think that they are the paper trail of idea. And if we look at their geography, in 1975, it would have been much more difficult to get uh, a picture of the, of the hurt at night in 1975. If we look at the distribution of patenting, we can see how hugely concentrated innovative ideas, the generation of new ideas was in 1975. If we look at the same map in 2012, we can see that economic activity and innovation is still highly concentrated. It is highly concentrated in few hotspots around the world, but if we can see that there is some change. Okay, if you compare the two maps, 1975, 2012, we can see new places stepping in, new places becoming important places where innovation, new ideas are being produced. And this largely concerns uh, Asia, uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe, and part of Latin America. Uh, we can look at some more data to look at how concentrated innovation is, uh, and we can compare it with income, for example. This is the Lorentz curve of income across all regions of the world, and you can see this is the green line. Uh, the closer the line to the 45 degree lines, the, the, the more distributed, the more even is the distribution of a certain variable, okay? So you can see that income is highly concentrated in space, but you compare the spatial distribution across regions of the world of patenting of new ideas, and you can see that they are substantially more concentrated. New ideas are being generated in a much smaller number of places around the world as opposed to where income is being generated. So the world is clearly not flat, okay? And if we try to get a sense of the mobility uh, of uh, uh, ideas around the world, we can look at the same set of regions. So all regions of the world, a large number of regions around the world, and we can compare how they were doing in terms of patenting, in terms of generating new ideas in the period 1975-1999, and compare the same trends, the same numbers in the uh, uh, years 2000-2012. The regions that stay along the red line are basically regions that remain in the same position. They were producing the same number of new ideas as measured by patents in 1975-1999, the same number in 2000-2012, okay? So you can see that many regions actually remain in the same place. Many regions were highly innovative in 1975 and remain innovative in 2012. Many regions were not innovative and remain not innovative. However, what attracted my attention as a researcher, as a scholar, are precisely the regions that are off this diagonal line, the regions that made it to the top, the regions that were able to change their position in the global distribution 
of uh, idea generation and move up, climb the mountains in this non-flat world. This was the, the key uh, attention, the key places I wanted to explore in my research in order to learn lessons for the places that were not making it to the top. Okay, understanding the places that were able to climb the mountains in order to uh, uh, learn important lessons for the places that were lagging behind, the places that are left behind. If we zoom into this same graph, we can look at continents and we can look at regions in those continents. Okay, this is just this same graph zooming on Asia. And we can see that an important part of the mobility, a large number of the regions that move uh, in the distribution of new ideas belong to uh, Asia. And we can look at uh, some examples, for example, Guangdong or Karnataka in India, where Bangalore is located. And I want to give you an idea of the difference that it makes moving along this distribution, okay? This is a picture of Guangzhou in 1984. This ain't Guangzhou in 2017. Okay, so making it to the top makes a huge difference in terms of how places look like. This is Bangalore in 1999, a commercial district in Bangalore, and this is the same commercial district in 2017. And the story, the story, the same incredible transformational power of innovation is not only true in Asia, it is also true in Central Eastern Europe. Let's look at the case of Lubuski in Poland, for example, again, a region that improved its position uh, uh, comparing the two time periods. And we can see the difference. This is Lubuski uh, in 1991, and this is how the infrastructural endowment of the same place look like today, okay? So dramatic change over a 20 year period. So moving in this distribution means a lot to places, to cities and regions. So the fundamental question for me as a researcher became, okay, what is it that moves regions? What is it that moves places up to the mountains of this very uneven world? Okay, and I started looking first into data, media, looking at public policies, and as a good student, only at the very end into books. So the very like striking feature of the world economy over the time period where the transitions that I mentioned before took place is about the dramatic change in global inflows of foreign direct investments. Basically, global economies, global cities, global regions, we are becoming more and more integrated into flows of capital, labor, knowledge, and innovation being bundled by the location decisions of multinational firms. If you look at this graph, you can see the change. There are ups and downs linking with the various crises, the dot-com crisis, the Great Depression, but you can see how there is a, generally, a general upward trend in global investment flows. However, the most important change regards the composition of these flows. Okay, if you look at these flows until the 2000s, the big destinations of foreign direct investments were the countries of the triad, the US, Europe, and Japan. In the year 2000, around the year 2000, the big change happens. And we can see the effects today. The large destinations of foreign direct investments, the larger destination in 2014, were not anymore advanced economies, but emerging countries, developing countries. This is a dramatic change over almost a 15 year period. So emerging countries become the very center of global investment flows. And if we try to understand how this is linked with innovation, how this is linked with the graph uh, that we discussed before, we can look at the location of cross-border research and development centers. It is where big ideas are being generated in the world. And if we look at this map, we can clearly see that there are important foreign research and development centers in the countries of the triad, the United States, Europe, and Japan, but more and more, there are very important, very large research centers being located by multinational firms in China, in India, and in part of Latin America. We can see that between the year 2000 and the year 2014, the number of multinational enterprises research centers in emerging countries grew by a factor of five. While in the triad countries, this number merely doubled. So it is true that research and development, the way in which generate new ideas is becoming more and more internationalized, but it is also true that this is happening disproportionately more in emerging countries. 
if we compare, if we look, uh, uh, if you compare this map with the map that looks at all foreign direct investment in research and development activity between 2004 and 2014, we get a very similar picture. Uh, a, a very significant innovation hotspots driven by uh, foreign direct investments are uh, being developed in a number of emerging countries. So the geography of the global generation of knowledge is dramatically changing around the globe. So it, it became very easy uh, for me to compare this map, the map of, of foreign direct investments in uh, research and development, with the first map I showed you, the map, the word innovation map, okay? And you can uh, clearly see the similarities. They almost look the same map. Uh, in inventive activities, innovation in 2012, uh, uh, foreign direct investments in research and innovation. So the same places that are being targeted by foreign direct investment are also places that become highly innovative. So I was very interested in this, uh, uh, in this link, in this re relationship that is a, a pure correlation at the moment between uh, global investment flows, the big, teas, the big thing of the 90s and the 20s, and then uh, the big thing in terms of the generation of new knowledge. Uh, foreign direct investments make it to the headlines. They have an enormous transformational power and they are at the very center of the debate, of the policy debate in a number of instances. This comes from BBC News uh, in 2006, okay? IBM opening a plant in India, okay? BBC News. Probably today it's not uh, a news anymore. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, investments from advanced economies in India that the BBC doesn't cover them anymore. But lots of emphasis today of investments, this is the Financial Times also, uh, to keep uh, uh, Martin happy, uh, 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 investments that come from emerging uh, economies into advanced economies. This is even about divestment, okay, in the UK. So uh, uh, multinational firms in emerging countries, have not, firms in emerging countries have not only developed uh, their technological capabilities internally, but now they are the big uh, actors uh, of uh, global investment flows in advanced economies. Okay, so big transformational power, uh, big uh, role in policy debates. Okay, so after like having, having looked into some data, after having uh, uh, read uh, some newspapers, spending uh, during my PhD uh, a lot of time uh, uh, checking newspapers online, um, I started reading some books. Okay, and the key question uh, is how do technology clusters emerge? How is it that some places in emerging countries start becoming innovative, start developing a technological trajectory? And very interesting answers come from the work of Annalise Saxinian, a very influential book, The New Argonauts. Annalise Saxinian basically presents a number of case studies where she looks at how technological clusters developed. She spends a, a, a particular emphasis on the case of Bangalore in India, and she explains the taking off of Bangalore uh, from a place with virtual, virtually absent IT uh, uh, basis into the region that now accounts for one-third of total India's IT exports uh, by looking at foreign-born entrepreneurs, by people that uh, were uh, moving uh, back uh, to their own country from the Silicon Valley, uh, bringing in new ideas into the local economy, bringing in entrepreneurial capacity new ideas. She looked at the importance of foreign contracts for firms in Bangalore, but most importantly, she placed the emphasis in her narrative about the importance of foreign firms setting up establishments in Bangalore, uh, in particular with reference to Hewlett and Packard and Texas Instruments uh, as very influential firms in shaping the technological trajectory of Bangalore. However, what Annalisa Axinian was doing was looking at a successful place and building a narrative about that place. Okay, so she was, of course, selecting her samples. She was looking at places that were making it to the top of the mountains and was trying ex post to develop a narrative about how that happened. So what I was interested in doing is trying to see, okay, what about the places that do not make it to the top? Are there any general lessons that we can learn by looking at all regions of the world, not only those that make it to the top, can we look at all sectors, not only IT, but see if we can learn something by looking at all technological sectors, and if there are lessons that we can generalize, something that we can learn that can be applicable to the regions that are left behind. So the way to start this quest is by looking at uh, Annalisa Axinian's story into our data. 
So what we did is to start looking into Bangalore, the same case that was explored by Nelly Saxinian, and look at IT patents as a measure of new ideas in IT being generated in Bangalore. And so we can look at how the technological trajectory of Bangalore developed over time. And we can uh, situate the first investment by Hewlett and Packard in our data. And we can see how the first investment by HP in Bangalore corresponded with the beginning of the technological takeoff of the cluster, very similarly to what uh, Annalisa Saxinian was suggesting. And if we look into patent data for the same sector and the same region that Annalisa Saxinian studied in her data, we can follow her, ent her entire narrative in our data. We can look at what happened to the generation of new ideas in Bangalore following the entry of the various companies into uh, uh, the uh, Bangalore uh, innovation system. And we can see the emergence of the Indian companies. We can see the emergence of Indian companies becoming producers of knowledge and becoming foreign investors, the, the ones that make it to the headline today in advanced economy. So this is the kind of exercise. Uh, what we really want to do is if we can have data across all regions of the world, across all sectors, to try and test the narrative that Annalisa Saxinian developed only for the case of Bangalore. So if we look more generally, if we look uh, across cases, if we look beyond case studies of individual firms or individual regions, we realize that we know very little about a number of fundamental aspects of the behavior and impacts of multinational firms and foreign direct investments. We know they are important, we know from policymakers, we know from the media, but we, if we look beyond case studies, beyond firm level case studies, regional case studies, about the allocation strategies and impacts, we realize that we have very little evidence. We have very little evidence about the location strategies. So where are multinational firms going and why? What is it that drives their investments, in particular the sub-national, at the regional, at the city level? We know very little about what activities are delocalized, where and how, and how location drivers vary across different types of multinational firms. For example, advanced economies multinationals versus uh, 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 emerging countries multinationals. Do they follow the same logic or not? But also, and this will be the focus of today's lecture, we know very little about their impacts. We know very little about their impacts in terms of innovation, in terms of employment, in terms of wealth in their host economies, in terms of their host regions, their host cities. We know very little about how they interact with uh, uh, domestic firms and what kind of m &Es actually help innovation and development in their host economies. Answers to these questions are hidden in between the gray areas uh, uh, between different streams of research, different topics, international economics, management, strategy, uh, international business, economic geography, public policy. So in order to make sense, to try to answer these questions by looking across a number of cases uh, and a number of examples, we really need to conceptualize uh, a bit. And I promise to my students that's only a conceptual slide uh, in the old presentation. Uh, we can think about the world as composed of two different countries. Okay, we have country A and country B. In country A and country B, there are sectors. Uh, there are regions and there are firms that operated in one or more sectors, uh, uh, in one or more region, and there are interactions uh, between firms. Okay, so we can think about the multinational world as a world where firms start operating across different countries. Okay, so our firm one is controlling some activities in country B. This can be in the form of, of fully owning a foreign subsidiary in country B, can be in the form of joining or forming a joint venture, can be in the form of an acquisition, acquiring a firm in another country. But we are interested in what happens once a firm in a certain country, in a certain region, start controlling activities in a different country. Okay, this is our broad conceptual framework. So what we want are data, comparable quantitative data, that can allow us to make sense of all these steps of all these different sections of the multinational world in order to test a number of hypotheses and answers a number of the questions that I mentioned before about the impact of these connections, about the impact of these flows. So let me start with the questions. As, 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 as all uh, researchers, uh, uh, I uh, generate a uh, lot of questions uh, and then have uh, good uh, colleagues uh, to find uh, the answers. Um, <laughs> 
So uh, the multinational world. Uh, do foreign firms make the world regions more innovative? Okay, this is our initial fundamental questions. Uh, is Annalisa Saxinian story replicable? Are multinationals across the, the world making regions more innovative? And the other fundamental question is what type of firms, what type of multinationals do the magic? Okay, politicians around the world really want to attract these types of multinationals. They want to attract the big innovation giants. Okay, there is a big fight uh, if you uh, look at the US newspapers to attract the, the second headquarter by Amazon, for example. So local politicians, national politicians all want the big firms. But are they right? Because if you look at the story by Annalisa Axinian, it seems that the story largely comes from HP uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So are, are, are large multinational firms that make your region more innovative. Is this actually true? Or are more like medium-sized innovators that can do the trick? So we really want to understand if the story is true, if multinationals make your region more innovative, and what kind of multinationals. So if we look at the, at, 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 at the graphic, uh, at, the more, at the small diagram that we explored before, we are interested in uh, a foreign investment, but our questions concern the firm that makes the investment. So do different types of multinational make a difference? And we are interested in the impacts on the recipient region, on the host region, and on the host sectors. Okay, so we try to uh, understand uh, first this kind of impacts. We cannot look at everything at the same time uh, because the problem would become intractable. So what we try to understand is to answer these fundamental questions. Uh, do multinational firms uh, change the regions and sectors that they, host, that they host their investment and how these impacts vary across different types of foreign firms? So how to answer? Uh, uh, together with Arnaud Dievre here at the LSE and Frank Nefke uh, at the Kennedy School of Government, we looked into the innovation performance of 1,528 regions. Okay, so basically all regions of the world, or, uh, 83 countries between 1975 and 2012, a very large time span. Uh, we relied on information on 3.6 million distinct, distinct inventors, okay, people generating new ideas, uh, and we analyzed 6 million patents from all over the world. Uh, and we didn't look at one sector. We looked at 1,240 sectors, okay, to try and see if we can find evidence of uh, uh, the story that I sketched before. What we did, uh, in order to answer our question, uh, to give you the intuition, is basically matching regions. So we have regions and sectors that receive foreign direct investment, that are treated by the entry of a foreign firm, and we have regions that are similar in a number of their observable characteristics, but that do not receive the investment. So what we want to do is to compare regions that receive the medication, regions that receive the foreign investment that are treated, with the control group of regions that are identical for all their observable characteristics, except for the fact that they didn't receive any foreign investment uh, in that particular sector before the entry of the foreign company uh, uh, in, the host in, in, the, in its host economy. To do this, we looked at investment flows. We really needed to identify uh, investments uh, uh, across the globe. Uh, we looked, uh, like I said, at the entire uh, uh, globe. And basically what we did, remember uh, as an example, Texas Instrument investing in Bangalore. Well, Texas Instrument wanted to invest in Bangalore, had different alternatives, okay? There was, Bangalore was there, but in the same year, a number of other regions in the area looked very similar. So what we do is to compare uh, uh, Bangalore with the possible alternatives, with regions that were similar in everything except for the fact that they didn't receive Texas, Texas instrument investment in information and communication technologies. Okay, and we try to see if there is a difference. So we are not picking uh, the winner. What we are doing is comparing uh, the region that received the investment with the regions that don't. And these are our results. In these results, uh, what you can see very clear, uh, clearly are the differences. The differences between the regions that receive the investments and the regions that don't, okay? And what matters is basically that before receiving the investment, the regions were not diverging, okay? So our control group had pretty much the same innovation output as the, the regions that were actually receiving the investment, okay? I want to make sure that I'm not selecting people that were getting better even without the aspirin, okay? I really want to make sure that they were doing pretty much the same before getting the investment, before getting the treatment. And our data confirmed this. That our control group and our treatment group, the regions receiving the investment, are uh, behaving pretty much in the same way. Then we have the investment that happens at, at time K, 
Okay, so a foreign investment enters uh, the regions, the treated regions, and we can see the impacts developing. We can see that the regions that receive the investment start diverging from the regions that don't. The regions that receive the foreign investment start becoming significantly more innovative than the regions that do not receive foreign investment. Okay, and this is true across regions, across uh, all sectors of the economy. However, uh, the, we know that there are two stories in there. There is one story that is linked with the subsequent entry of more multinational firms, okay? So part of the fact that we observe is driven by the fact that following the first investor, further investors follow, and they start generating local innovation. But what I'm showing here is that there is also an impact when we look exclusively at domestic firms. So we exclude all the new ideas that are generated by other multinational firms. So we do have an impact, that is this one, the total impact, partially driven by subsequent entry of other multinational firms following the first inventor, but we also have a purely domestic impact, a purely domestic spillover. Domestic firms start producing more innovation. Okay, this is what uh, policymakers are highly concerned about. However, what matters for our question is what about the investing company? Okay, we really want to know what are the multinationals that bring about these changes? We really want to know what types of multinationals. Does it make sense to attract Google or not? Well, if we look at the impact of the top 5% most innovative foreign investing companies, we can see that impacts almost disappear. We can see that the big technological giants, these are the top 5% most innovative companies in the world, when they treat host regions, their impact is almost non-existent, or it's much smaller than the overall impact. Large part of the impact in the host economies is driven by medium-sized innovators, is driven by multinational firms that invest abroad, that are innovative, but are not the big technological giants. Okay, they are in the bottom 80% of the global patenting distribution. And in other, so this gives a, a very powerful message to policymakers. I'm not the usual suspects that can change your technological trajectory. But a very different type of beast is the one that can change your technological future. And of course, we really wanted to understand why. Why is that? And we carefully looked at the mechanisms. We carefully looked at the links between the investing companies and the host economy. And uh, by uh, doing this, we found two different mechanisms that are at play when the investor is a large top multinational, a technological giant, as opposed to a more medium-sized innovator. The first, uh, the first evidence that we find, looking at the circulation of workers in and out the multinational, so uh, that, that move to the place with the multinational and are hired by domestic companies, and vice versa, domestic workers that are hired by the multinational, we find that this mobility, this flow of, of, of technological workers in and out the multinationals it's mu is much smaller with the technological giants. The big technological giants are much better at retaining their staff, are much better in keeping and absorbing the best staff from the local economy. The same is not true for smaller multinationals that are innovative, but they need to interact more with local firms. They need to interact more with the local environment, and therefore we exchange statistically, in a statistically significant fashion, more people, more knowledge with the local environment. So this is the first channel, and the second important channel has to do with technological distance. Uh, the big technological giants are very far away, very remote from the technological capability of domestic companies. The kind of innovative processes that they work on are completely different, completely disjoint from the innovative activities pursued by uh, uh, the local companies. And this leads to uh, much less interaction in terms of patent citations. Again, we can measure that and we find a statistically significant difference between the top innovative companies and uh, uh, the medium-sized innovators around the globe. So we answered a number of, of questions, okay? So multinationals uh, make uh, uh, your regions more innovative, but they do it in a way that is not what policymakers around the world expect. Now, the questions become, do foreign firms make all regions more innovative? Uh, is this story true across uh, different national uh, innovation systems, uh, across different national uh, systems, and what types of investment? 
we know that different types of investment uh, uh, trigger very different reactions uh, in uh, the local economies, in the recipient economies. When it comes to greenfield investments, when it comes to building a brand new establishment, then uh, local policymakers are very happy. Okay, we are going to get more jobs in the local economy. But when it comes to acquisitions, when it comes to foreign companies acquiring assets in the regional economy, then reactions are much more uh, cautious. Okay? Uh, this comes, for example, from an Italian newspaper in the hands of foreigners, more and more Italian flagship uh, uh, brands. Okay? The foreigners are getting our assets. So what we really want to examine is what happens when we have different types of connections, when uh, the investing company and the destination, the host economy, develop different types of connections. Uh, are these uh, 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 fully wholly owned subsidiaries in the form of greenfield investments? Are we dealing with acquisitions? Okay, and we want to see what are the impacts on the regions that host the investments, but also we want to see how these impacts vary across countries. Uh, suggesting that different national systems might make a difference uh, in impacts. So in order to answer this question, uh, I have uh, to uh, make you travel a bit uh, again, and uh, we move to Latin America. Okay, and we uh, looked uh, at three Latin American countries, um, Brazil, uh, Mexico, and Colombia. Uh, very different uh, level of uh, uh, economic development, uh, if you want, in terms of GDP, but also very different models of internationalization, okay, very different degrees of exposure to trade, very different uh, uh, indigenous uh, country level efforts in terms of research and development, very different levels of innovation output, again, uh, measured by patents. So with uh, uh, Alexander Yax, uh, we looked into the innovation performance of regions uh, in Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico during the 2003-2012 period, uh, running one of the very first analyses at the subnational level uh, combining uh, several countries in Latin America. Uh, with the countries that we covered uh, in our study, we were able to account uh, for approximately 60% uh, uh, of uh, uh, the GDP, uh, 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 the population in Latin America, 65% uh, of uh, uh, GDP, 56% uh, of uh, FDI uh, inflows, and 83% of total patenting. So we use, we developed a large data set uh, looking at greenfield investments and uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions in those economies, and we developed uh, an enormous innovative patent count in order to be able to capture exclusively domestic patents, a, a, a new ideas that are developed locally. Um, and in so doing, we are able to look at the impacts of different types of investments, so different types of entry mode into the domestic economy, and compare uh, those impacts across uh, heterogeneous national systems and uh, regional economies. Uh, like I said, a very uh, complex uh, uh, information basis uh, in, uh, at the basis of our analysis. Uh, we needed to geocode, find for uh, detailed uh, information uh, as far as uh, investments uh, are concerned and as far as uh, different types of investments, acquisitions, uh, greenfield investments, and uh, patent applications in different countries uh, in Latin America. Uh, but this analysis really paid off. We were able to find a number of new insights uh, that were uh, previously uh, uh, unexplored. Uh, what we uh, found is that uh, the business function, what is, is actually pursued uh, uh, by the foreign company in the local economy, uh, crucially matters. Um, investments that are dedicated uh, to research and development activities, on average, uh, generate uh, more local innovation than other types of investments. However, we really need to take into account the country position in global value chains, to what extent a country is integrated into global value chains. Production-focused FDI, for example, have a strong uh, impact in, uh, on innovation in Mexican regions. The idea is that Mexico is more integrated into, into global value chains, and therefore, even production-oriented FDI, non-R&D-oriented uh, FDI, can generate an impact on local innovation. Also, what we find is that it's really too simplistic, as many policymakers are doing, to argue that greenfield investment is good, acquisitions is bad. Uh, we do find that mergers and acquisitions in the context of Latin America do provide a more direct channel for knowledge diffusion. So there is more proximity when the foreign investor acquires uh, a, local a local firm, it's easier uh, for uh, knowledge exchange to take 
place. So acquisitions become a better channel for uh, the local economy. And local conditions, of course, and efforts matter a lot. Trying to attract foreign investments as such is not necessarily a good strategy. Uh, what matters is the education of the local workforce and R&D spending in the local economy. So local conditions uh, need to be carefully matched with the type of investments that are being attracted in each individual country, in each individual region. So finally, let me move a step further and go beyond innovation. Okay, so uh, the previous uh, two examples uh, that we uh, visited together uh, uh, looked at the generation of patents, the generation of new uh, uh, ideas, things that are new uh, to the world, new to the market. Uh, now I really want to go with you in places that are at the very origin of uh, the axis th in the graph that I presented before. Places that were not innovative in 1975 and are not innovative today. And try to see what is the impact of foreign direct investment there. Can foreign direct investment bring about change uh, in those contexts? The fundamental question is how does FDI impact domestic firms, not necessarily in terms of innovation, but in terms of their investments, in terms of their production, in terms of their employment? And the other fundamental question is to what extent local conditions shape the link between foreign direct investments and domestic firms? What kind of local conditions need to be in place for those investments to bring about change in their host economies. And in particular, we focus on uh, the local availability of credit as one special uh, uh, institutional arrangement that might matter for the impact of foreign direct investment. So then again, looking at the initial schematics, we are looking at the impact of foreign direct investments, but looking at how investments impact domestic firms. Okay, so now the impact is not anymore at the regional or only at the sectoral level, it's about how foreign direct investment impact have generate impacts at the firm level and how these effects are mediated by regional conditions and sectoral conditions. Okay, so different perspective on the problem. In order to answer the questions, again, I need to ask you to travel a bit, and we move to Ethiopia. We moved to Ethiopia, and together uh, with Arnaud Dievre and uh, uh, Nicola Limodio, we looked at FDI, at all foreign direct investments uh, in Ethiopia. A very interesting case, because Ethiopia opened uh, to foreign direct investment in the 1990s, the very beginning uh, of uh, the graph of foreign uh, direct investment that I showed you at the beginning, and offers us the possibility to follow the entire geographical evolution of FDI location rapidly and at the same time of rapidly evolving local credit markets. So a very interesting case to study the coevolution of these two uh, phenomena. Uh, uh, in order to address the questions, again, data. Uh, we developed a unique data set on three dimensions of the economy. The first has to do with all foreign direct investment projects with detailed location information and sector of activity. Detailed data on all or large part of local firms, large and medium-sized firms, and then the universe of bank branches opening in Ethiopia. So the distribution of uh, credit. So domestic firms, basically, uh, that come from the census are shocked by FDI, so th they react to the impact on an, of an FDI that enters their city and their sector of activity. And we look at how this impact is shaped by the availability of credit at the local level. Here you can see the evolution of foreign direct investments from 1992 in Ethiopia, developing in 2002, and finally in 2016. And here you can see the evolution of bank branches from the 1980s until today. We try to link these two phenomena and we, fi we find, we think, very interesting insights. Foreign direct investment bo uh, boosts the demand for bank loans by domestic firms. And this increase uh, uh, in uh, bank loans uh, shape uh, the investment in capital equipments and production in domestic for firms, but lowers employment. Okay, so firms are moving towards capital uh, intensive processes and they start firing workers. And this leads to a polarization in their employment structure. We see a decline in low wage employment, so low skilled people being made redundant, high skilled people being hired. We have an increase in the number of people with high wage. The very interesting story is, however, if we look at the more financially developed areas, those where local uh, branches of banks are open, we don't see a, a, any negative effect on employment. We see that also employment is going up, and we also see that the effect on the polarization of employment disappears. All uh, um, types of workers, both low wage and high wage, get hired. 
uh, increase uh, uh, in domestic firms. This tells us a very important lesson. Okay, this tells us foreign direct investments can have a huge transformational power in Africa. However, policies that target foreign direct investments need to be carefully coupled with policies dealing with local conditions, and in particular, in this case, with the availability of credit at the local level for domestic firms. So let me draw uh, uh, some uh, very general uh, uh, conclusions. Um, so I, I hope I gave you a sense uh, of this uh, research agenda and this field of research. This is an exciting field of research and constantly improving data availability at the sub-national and firm level for advanced, emerging and developing economy makes new insight easier to achieve. Uh, multinational enterprises' preferences and strategies are highly heterogeneous, highly differentiated in terms of sectors, global value chain stages, innovation intensity, and remote acquisitions versus gre greenfield investment, as I showed you. And this results in very complex sub-national geographies of internationalization. Internationalization and global connectivity, I hope I was able to convince you of this, are uh, key to regional development but not necessarily in the forms and via the, via the channels presented by the existing literature and that policymakers are given for granted. The channels and the mechanisms might be very difficult. Careful research is needed in order to inform more cautious regional and local development policies. So we conclude uh, that the world is not flat, uh, but some regions uh, and cities do make it to the top. Uh, it is very hard to make it to the top alone. There is no alternative to openness and internationalization. Regions cannot really grow and develop and innovate in isolation. Walls are not going to make any region better off, no matter how big and rich the region is. Regions and cities, therefore, should embrace globalization with a critical active attitude and make evidence-based decisions for their future. And we hope that this research can contribute to these evidence-based decisions. Let me conclude, however, with a small test for you. Okay? As in all my uh, lectures, at the end of the lecture slides, you can find exam questions. Uh, so I have some questions for you. So there are three statements. Okay? Uh, you should carefully read those statements and think about the origin, okay? the authors of the three statements. Okay, you have a bit less than one minute because I see the chair a little bit worried about the timing. <laughs> okay, I give you a little help. Okay. Do you want to have the solutions? Okay, the first one comes from Bill Clinton, the President of the United States in Hanoi, Vietnam, in the year 2000. Uh, it was claimed that globalization is not something we can hold off or turn off. It is the economic equivalent of a force of nature like wind or water. And you can see how this statement seems to very closely match the statement by the Chinese president, uh, uh, given uh, uh, around the same time uh, uh, in Vietnam uh, a few days ago. Globalization is an irreversible historical trend, and free trade needs to be more open, more balanced, more equitable, and more beneficial to all. You can contrast this uh, with the view of another uh, American president, uh, Donald Trump, uh, and I combined uh, two statements, uh, uh, one from 2016 and one uh, on the same occasion in Vietnam in 2017. Globalization has left millions of workers with nothing but poverty and heartache. Free trade had cost millions of, he was saying, American jobs. So I, I think this lecture showed us how the role, the relative weight uh, and the relative center of technological development has shifted. So the world is not flat as mountains, and those mountains are constantly moving around. The mountains of innovation are moving, are moving away from the Western world in favor of emerging countries, in particular in Asia and in part of Latin America. This has dramatic implications from all our lives in terms of uh, politics, in terms of the economy, and in terms of innovation. It is the small niche on which I focused with my presentation. But if regions, if cities want to success in this ever-changing world, they do need to make sense of these big trends and link these major transformations to their local and regional development strategies. Thank you very much.
let me just add uh, one thing, a little bit of advertisement. If you like this lecture, uh, there is a very nice uh, LSC blog uh, that uh, covers a lot of the uh, issues that we discuss in the lecture. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge the founder uh, of a large part of this research, the European Research Council. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I told you before that things can change, and they can change a lot in just 13 years. And I'm sure that you're a lot, many of you are itching to go and ask questions, but there's a procedure here. And uh, we got, we're very honored to have today with us a discussant, uh, Martin Sambu from the FT. And I think that Ricardo is going to regret having cited The Economist, not the, the FT, because Martin is going to have no mercy with Ricardo from now on. Martin uh, is, uh, has been writing about economics for the FT since 2009, when he joined the paper as an economics leader writer. He now writes the FC, FT's free lunch, which is a daily economic comment. Before joining the FT, he worked in academia and policy consulting, and he has taught and carried out research at Harvard, Columbia, and the Wharton School, and has degrees from both Oxford and Harvard University. So Martin, Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me, and, and congratulations to Professor Crescenzi on his chair, on assuming his chair. Um, I'll try and be very quick, because you want to hear, ask questions and hear the answers, and so do I. Uh, but as a lapsed academic, uh, and uh, now an economics commentator in a newspaper, my job is to try and translate academic ideas into what they mean and why they're important for policy. And I thought I would briefly try and talk about why Ricardo's ideas matter in that way. I'd like to start by, uh, with a quote by John Maynard Keynes that you will have heard before because it's quoted all the time, but there's a reason for that, and it's that it contains a, a deep truth. Keynes wrote, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. I am sure that the power of vested interest is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. Uh, and what I want to do is to just put in context the gradual encroachment of ideas that Ricardo's work represents. Uh, so to do that, let me take you on a sort of whirlwind tour of the history of economic thought on international trade and international economic interaction. Uh, I think this year actually is 200 years since the field really started uh, with uh, David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. Ricardo explained why some countries export some things and other countries export other things. It depends on what you're relatively best at. His example was Portugal exporting wine and England exporting woven cloth. Um, that was the start of how economists thought about international economic integration. Over time, the question continued to be, why do some countries export some things and import other things, and why is this different? Why is there trade? Why don't you just pr produce for yourself? Uh, the answer gradually looked at endowments of, nat of uh, resources and inputs. Countries with a lot of capital compared to labor would produce capital-intensive goods. Countries with a lot of labor and not so much capital would produce labor-intensive goods, and they would trade according to that comparative advantage. Um, so resource endowments was kind of the standard theory, you know, up until the 50s, the 60s. Then you added a theory of increasing returns of scale because you had to explain why France sold cars to Germany and Germany sold cars to France. Why did they actually trade in the same goods? And so you got people like Paul Krugman developing these theories of intra-industry trade. But all of this was about trade in final goods, the sort of goods that you and I as consumers buy in the shop or in a car dealership or whatever it is. There was nothing really there uh, about any of the things that Ricardo's been talking about. Nothing about multinational companies, companies organizing their production across national borders. There was nothing about foreign direct investment, about companies moving capital or investing productive capital factories in other countries. There was nothing then, therefore, about how knowledge and know-how and technology was embodied in those investments. Uh, there was nothing about the agglomeration of clusters based on those initial investments. 
Uh, and the unit of analysis tended to always be the nation state rather than cities and regions that Ricardo talked about. Now, the kind of conventional, traditional theory can be, for, can be forgiven for that neglect because up until about the 1980s, uh, the world didn't really look very much like what Ricardo has described. It was really very much trade in final goods or maybe commodities, raw materials and final goods. Uh, and that has changed in very little time. Today, most trade, well more than half, one number I've seen is two thirds, of global trade is inside these global supply chains. So either inside the same multinational company or a, or a group of companies inside a production process sending an intermediate good from one production location to one in another country, then that goes to a third country, and so on. You know, as an illustration, in these times of Brexit, the auto manufacturing supply chain in Britain will often have parts crossing borders five, six, seven, eight times. Uh, but this is new. Um, and the, the change has happened tremendously fast. And it's really only now that theorists, academics, are catching up with this. And, and Ricardo is sort of at the forefront of that both empirical research and theorizing about what's happened. Now, you will all have caught on to the political importance of this change, but let me explicitly put it to you that these changes that Ricardo is studying uh, are really at the core of the big economic policy challenges all of our countries are facing and the political upheaval that we're all struggling with and that has to do with how we haven't managed those economic changes very well in the past. So, you know, let me just briefly show how the various aspects of, uh, of Ricardo's uh, presentation plays into current politics. One is the emphasis on knowledge, innovation, and technology. The fact that economic growth is knowledge-based creates a bias towards those places and people who are well-equipped to benefit and contribute to innovation. It's sort of a bias towards the high human capital, knowledge, uh, those in possession of knowledge and the ability to use knowledge, and against, for example, manual work as a traditional working class. Um, it's a bias towards cities rather than rural areas because ideas and technology tend to thrive more in cities. Uh, Ricardo didn't focus very much on clustering and agglomeration in this presentation, but some of his work focuses on that once the first investment happens, other investments tend to follow in these FDI flows. So a small initial advantage can turn into a permanent difference between those who do manage to benefit from the new global economy and those that are left behind. Um, because so much of this happens within companies, a country can't really think of its economy as sort of its prerogative anymore because so much of prosperity depends on being part of a supply chain that goes across borders and is much more managed by companies that no longer belong to a single nation. This is why the sort of attempt at breaking up the current trade patterns in the US with Trump, the threat of trying to pull out of NAFTA, or indeed managing Brexit is so complicated. The economist Richard Baldwin has said that trying to put up tariffs or protectionism generally today is a bit like putting up a wall in the middle of a factory floor you can't really manipulate your national economy in the same way anymore. Um, and, and finally, an, another aspect of this, uh, which is part of the conversation, Ricardo didn't talk so much about it, is migration. FDI links create incentives and possibilities of migration. After those initial investments in Bangalore, there are now a lot of IT engineers who are attractive employee prospects for technology firms in California. And it works the other way too. There's research showing that FDI flows are often linked with expat communities. I'm sure that's part of the story in, in Ethiopia. Uh, so all of this means that it's a very new kind of economic situation and we're still learning how in terms of policy making to best manage this and take advantage of this and protect or help those who don't. Uh, I'll finish by just finishing, completing that Keynes quote um, because he continued like this. In the field of economic and political philosophy, there are not many who are influenced by new theories 
after they are 25 or 30 years of age. So that the ideas which civil servants and politicians and even agitators apply to current events are not likely to be the newest. But soon or late, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good or evil. So I want to finish by addressing directly the students in the room because of Keynes's focus on age. Um, we are in a politically challenging moment because the ideas, the old ideas that guided policymaking until recently were not up to the task. Many of you will have to spend your professional lives on doing better and managing those challenges. Uh, and you should count yourselves fortunate that you are in an institution and with a professor who will give you the knowledge to equip you to that task. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, we'll just pass briefly the word to Ricardo before we go to, into questions to see if you want to just have a quick reply to Martin. Well, thanks, Martin. I think you highlighted an, a number of very important points that uh, for, uh, for a number of aspects uh, form uh, our uh, broader research agenda. Uh, in terms of looking at uh, the geography and impacts of global value chains and the impact of uh, uh, migration, the link between foreign uh, and direct investments, multinationals as tools that bundle together uh, ideas, uh, uh, knowledge, uh, and people. Uh, so it's not, not anymore as in standard macroeconomic, the idea of capital uh, being moved around only, but it's really about understanding how these different flows are bundled together and strategically managed by multinational firms and how the strategies of multinational firms interact with the strategies of countries or national governments, but also regional governments and uh, cities. Uh, so you touched upon very important issues that are definitely uh, in our agenda for uh, future and current research. Good Thanks. to hear. Okay, so it's now time. I know that you've been waiting very patiently, but it's now time to open the floor to questions. So if I can start over there, please. Yes, you with the hand up. Yes. Thank you for the stimulating talk. Um, my question is about a, a detail rather than the global. Um, a couple of slides before you got to the Argonauts, you showed investment in patent activity globally, um, for I think 2012 or 2014. And it seemed to be a big anomaly was Malaysia. If you, particularly if you compare it with, with its neighbors, Thailand and Indonesia, it was having a lot of foreign investment, but not producing much patent activity. Now, is that an anomaly of mapping? Is it Singapore's position there that's uh, innovative, but too small to show on your map in the way that you color it? Or is there some strange thing going on there? Okay, I think we should gather a few questions and then continue. Any more questions coming from the audience? Up there. Please, Ron. Yes, it's, it's uh, coming. Ron Martin from the University of Cambridge. Um, an outstanding lecture, Ricardo. Thank you so much for that. And also very enjoyable comments afterwards. A couple of questions, I think, uh, or comments. Uh, the first is that, uh, in many ways, the focus on multinationals, I think, is highly pertinent to emerging and developing countries. Um, if one comes back to advanced countries, say the UK, uh, one can find instances, my own region is one, where the dynamics of innovation has come from local, indigenous firms. The multinationals come in at a later stage <coughs> to take over and merge with <coughs> and acquire the local firms. So it's not organic growth by the multinationals, it's acquisition. So in a sense, there's an interesting, perhaps a different dynamic between different <coughs> parts of the globe in that sense. But my main comment is this, that um, quite rightly you're focusing, as indeed many of us do, on looking to where these sorts of developments take place. You know, the innovative places tend to be the richer places and so on and so forth. What's equally important, I think, and we don't do much of this, and perhaps we should, is that these, in these innovations have implications and effects on other people elsewhere. In many cases, they're positive impacts. In other cases, they can be negative impacts. And we don't trace the implications of what happens in these prosperous areas 
for what happens positively or indeed often negatively in areas that aren't fortunate enough to actually get on this, this sort of bandwagon, um, fortunate bandwagon of, of innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go like the third one. Valtrao, please. Thank you, Walter Czekli, uh, from the European Institute, and also thank you to can you, both can you of talk louder? We cannot hear you. Um, so thank you very much, both of you, for your presentation. I was just had this question: How global are actually global value chains? If Martin Sandbu is right that all freedoms play a big role in having global value chains, then they should be very European in a sense, because it is that region that has the four freedoms while across the, uh, the Atlantic and between the other <coughs> world regions, there is still a difficulty of having the same form and, and extent of, of mobility. Okay, so uh, Ricardo, you can uh, have the first round of answers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, as far as the first question is concerned on uh, how heterogeneous our, um, how heterogeneous, does it work? I'm not sure, I cannot hear you well, so. Okay, like this, okay. <laughs> um, so in terms of, um, the heterogeneity of impacts. This is uh, precisely what we are trying to study. In the sense, what we are trying to see is uh, how uh, impacts vary across cities and across uh, different contexts. Um, therefore, our analysis uh, and what I, I was able to present of the analysis cannot offer you a detailed story on individual cities, on individual countries, but can tell you a lot ab about the dimensions along which impacts vary. Um, if you are interested in, in going uh, more in depth, of course, there is the full uh, uh, research that uh, will be uh, soon available, but on our uh, blog, you can really zoom in into the globe. So what I presented in a visual, in a very aggregated fashion, you can fully navigate. Uh, uh, um, I didn't uh, trust enough uh, uh, LSC IT services uh, to be able to show you uh, the interactive version. Uh, so I, I relied on screenshots, because usually when I lecture, uh, uh, um, the computer has, uh, do not work. Uh, uh, but you can visit our blog and you are able really to zoom, trace individual investment flows and you can look at the impacts in individual cities uh, to get a much more nuanced uh, uh, picture of the evidence that I presented in an aggregated uh, fashion. Um, on uh, the source of innovation, well, I, I, I think absolutely it's very interesting to uh, study the different models of innovation in the sense how different is the, is the way in which technological trajectories develop in emerging countries and the way in which the same trajectories unfolded uh, over time in uh, the countries of the triads in uh, Europe, uh, uh, the United States and Japan. And I th part of our research is more recent uh, analysis. We are really trying uh, to see to what extent uh, the conventional view of how innovation, for example, uh, developed in the United States uh, uh, is uh, 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 working when you try uh, to explore uh, 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 stories uh, of multinational firms uh, uh, across large samples. So trying to see, okay, are firms really born global or not? To what extent uh, the story of firms uh, 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 starting their technological development locally and then uh, becoming multinational uh, was there at the time and is still there or not? So uh, I, I think the, 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 the questions uh, uh, that uh, you run uh, presented are very important issues that deserve uh, further research. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, um, impacts in, uh, uh, of, of innovation in prosperous areas uh, and the bandwagon effects on non-prosperous areas, I think this is also uh, extremely important. That's why uh, when we started uh, uh, this project on innovation, also immediately uh, the attention went to places where you would not expect innovation and try to see what the potential impacts uh, might be in those places. Uh, hence, uh, for example, our research on Ethiopia. And we were very interested in finding uh, this impact on the polarization of incomes. Mm. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis in advanced economies as foreign direct investments as a means to bring development, uh, for example, in, in Africa. But uh, we really need to take this kind of insights very carefully because if the right conditions are not in place, then effects uh, uh, can be very different from what, for example, politicians expect. Because the idea is we foster foreign direct investment, we get more development, we get a better management, for example, of migration flows. But if your foreign direct investments are making redundant uh, the low skill end of the labor force, then impacts on migration flows might be highly counterintuitive, for example. So in all this research agenda, there is a lot of attention on uh, potential uh, effects on uh, other places, on, on places that are left uh, behind. 
the question on how uh, a global are global value chains, uh, well, uh, I mean, it, it, it is a very, uh, I think, important question empirically in the sense that it's already very hard to measure global value chains, uh, to get reliable data on global value chains themselves. So there is, again, uh, a, a lot of anecdotal evidence. There are a number of case studies looking at individual value chains, for example, uh, but very limited uh, large-scale cross-sectional analysis that allows us to uh, look at, uh, at global value chains at their geography, so th as to be able to measure also their uh, localization and to uh, assess their impacts. Uh, from our like preliminary insights, looking at the subnational dimension of global value chains, what attracts the high value sections of value chains are very uh, specific uh, uh, regional characteristics that have to do with uh, uh, socioeconomic conditions, uh, supportive institutions, uh, 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 high concentration of research and development, and human capital. And this suggests that global value chains are global, but at the same time highly localized. The, the high value added bits of value chains tend to be highly concentrated in a few places, in a few hotspots around the world. So they are global, but very local at the same time. Martin, would you like to add anything to that? Um, no, let's have another round of questions. Okay, so we have time for another round of questions. So anyone? Paul, do you want to? No. Back over there, so yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> Do you hear me? Yes, please say yep, your name. Okay. And so um, my question would be for Ricardo, and thank you very much for your speech. We cannot uh, really hear you. So okay. mm. I'd like to challenge a little bit your imagination. So um, two days ago, there was the uh, Security United Nations represent, uh, representer from, uh, from America here on campus, and I'd like to address the same question to you that I addressed to him. So. Um, if you would think that, um, I mean, did you ever think that as the United Nations represents the interests of nations, uh, there is currently uh, United Corporations, a uh, similar structure, a uh, parallel one to the United Nations, which has hundreds of millions of citizens, which is equally powerful, whose leadership is uh, more trustworthy than most of the politicians around the world. Um, do you believe that in this context, the nation, the one that you mentioned, uh, the concept of the nation is an outdated model? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's collect uh, one or two more questions. Oh, sorry. Over there, yeah. Wait, wait for the microphone, please. So I thought it was a wonderful lecture, Ricardo. So I'm Neil Lee, I'm a, one of Ricardo's colleagues. Um, so one of the things about multinationals is that they seem to, while they seem to be spreading the benefits, they also seem to concentrate it amongst certain groups in certain countries. And I guess I'm interested in your view on, on what we can, should we be concerned about that? And if so, what can we do about it? Any final questions? All right, if not, I'm going to give the floor to Ricardo for some final words. Well, yeah, let me uh, answer uh, the, the two questions. The first about the concept of nation. Well, um, from our analysis, uh, countries uh, do matter uh, in terms of understanding the location strategies and in terms of understanding uh, uh, the way in which policies can be designed uh, to shape the impacts of foreign direct investments. So countries do matter, but at the same time we have, uh, when we analyze uh, uh, the strategies and when we analyze the impacts of foreign direct investments, uh, we do find that new actors emerge. And those are regions with their governments, are cities that play an increasingly important role in terms of driving different types of investments and making investment work or not for their local economy. Um, concerning uh, the, the, the benefits and uh, the way in which uh, those benefits are uh, distributed. Uh, thanks, Neil, for your question. I uh, would like to anticipate a bit something uh, that uh, uh, I will present, uh, I think, on Friday at the Regional Studies Association Conference uh, concerning the link uh, between uh, foreign direct investment and Brexit. Okay, this is uh, other work uh, that we did trying to see how the internationalization of the economy uh, is linked with uh, uh, the voting pattern for Brexit. Mm. Uh, and our results suggested that it's not internationalization per se, it's not exposure to global uh, uh, investment flows that change the 
attitudes of people in the constituencies that are exposed to uh, internationalization. Um, what matters is really the interaction between the attitude of people and uh, in the internationalization of the economy. Uh, what we uh, found out, is if you look at London, for example, it's a highly internationalized economy, but also uh, local residents are highly internationalized, and therefore you have a strong uh, pattern in favor of remain. If you look at other places in the UK that are internationalized, uh, and this was the apparent paradox, they are internationalized and they voted uh, uh, Leave. This seemed apparently against their interest. Well, our results suggest that basically uh, uh, places that voted Leave are the places where there is a disconnection between being internationalized at work and being localistic at home, uh, being able to embrace uh, uh, the globalization of the economy uh, with uh, an understanding of uh, uh, the world economy and its changes. So we hope that this research can, in a certain sense, contribute to realigning uh, uh, global, uh, the globalization of the economy with the understanding that people have of the pros and cons of the process of globalization. Martin, some famous last words. Yeah, yeah, I just want to add, add a few thoughts on this issue of governance, which is clearly what comes out as the most, most intense policy question from all of this research. But this is difficult to deal with, and where are nations in this, because political action still is largely at the level of nations, as you pointed out, uh, is, is important. Uh, I would just add that on the it, it's, it goes two ways. On the one hand, nations are less empowered than before, national governments. And that's because in order to prosper, you need to be part of these global value chains. In order to do that, you have to make sure that your economic actors can kind of smoothly integrate with those in other countries, because these global supply chains are cross-border and multinationals run a lot of them. Uh, and that's why trade agreements and so on have to do with regulatory harmonization, having sort of similar rules so that something you do in one country automatically is valid or legal in another country. And that's what a lot of the economic side of the EU project has been about. That doesn't mean that nations are powerless. So, you know, I'm one who differs a bit with Danny Roderick's view that there is this trilemma uh, of global governance, that you can't have hyper-globalization and democracy and national sovereignty at the same time. Because nation states can still do a lot. You mentioned some things. Take the example of deepening the banking system in Ethiopia. That's something a national government can do. And it's an example of something I have a national government can enable its regions and its people to take part profitably in global supply chains. You can also use national polities to mitigate the fallout for those who suffer. You can protect the labor market, for example, by you know, minimum wages, other sort of labor regulations, and make sure that people don't fall through a floor. And you can, of course, try and equip people, educational policies, skills policies, and so on, uh, to be in a better position when these changes happen. What you can't do is to stop the big global change from happening. And, and I just want to finish on one observation that I think makes your work even more relevant. So you, you uh, chartered total FDI flows, I think 1.5 trillion a year in global FDI flows, direct investment flows. That's a huge number, but it's only about 2% of world gross domestic products, 2% of global economic activity. On a national level, business investment is typically around 20%, and in some of the emerging economies, even more than that, so 10 times, 15 times more. So as I see it, there's all reason to believe that these flows will become bigger. 2% is small compared to how much investment actually goes on. So there's all reason to think that the things you're talking about will intensify, become even more important economically, and therefore even more important to govern properly politically. OK, so I'm going to get leave uh, the last uh, words for Ricardo, but I'm going to do it using my prerogative in the form of a question. In 2008, we wrote a paper called Mountains in a Flat World, and you have clearly demonstrated that those mountains still exist, but since 2000, you have also shown us that there are massive tectonic shifts. I just want you to get out your crystal ball and tell us what's going to happen. Are the mountains that we are now inhabit, like London, going to suffer and suffer massively? And should we prepare our children for a more competitive life in mountains that are arising elsewhere, mainly in South Asia, Southeast Asia, but also in parts of Latin America, you, as you have shown. Uh, thanks, Andres. Uh, I, th I think that if we look at current events, 
we know and we learn that if the way in which tectonic forces make mountains emerge are not uh, uh, managed and are not accompanied by uh, appropriate policies uh, uh, to mitigate the, uh, their impacts, to uh, redistribute the benefits that come from agglomeration to places that are left behind, then we observe major inefficiencies. We, we, we observe uh, uh, events, uh, political events that can uh, completely reshape uh, uh, the way in which uh, economic activists can be organized in space and can work across countries. Um, therefore, uh, uh, if, if we look at the, the current situation, we definitely uh, uh, see uh, uh, the reinforcement of existing mountains, of some of the existing mountains, but very strong movements, uh, 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 like we pointed out, in the center of gravitation of uh, the world economy uh, in favor of Asia and in part of Latin America. Um, it, it, but it is very important that appropriate policies are designed in the places where some of the mountains uh, in advanced economies will disappear, but also in the places where the new mountains are being created to make sure that the benefits uh, of uh, economic development and agglomeration are spread, spread in an equitable fashion. Uh, otherwise, the price uh, can be extremely high uh, in terms of uh, the reaction of those that are left behind. Okay, it's clear for, for, from this that uh, Ricardo, like Spider-Man, is taking his newfound uh, um, uh, powers with huge responsibility. I would like to thank Martin and especially Ricardo for this fantastic lecture and I would like please to join me in an applause uh, to celebrate uh, his achievements. <laughs> <laughs>